weekend. Um, we are going to have from Jamaica. I'm from UNCP Jamaica, um, UNCP Deputy of the Bay. My name is um, Dr. Elsie Lohan Shunun, and this is Trudy Ann James Linton from the Ministry of Finance and Planning. All right. Um, today we're going to present some innovative idea on um, behavioral insight using using design thinking. Now, the way it started is um, we were approached, UNTP was approached about two months ago, uh, four months ago by the Ministry of Finance to see how we can help them um, in their change management process. They were going to some changes that were dictated by the IMF agreement, so they wanted to see how UNTP can help them to find the right experts who could help them implement the change management. So when that, um, the idea of the innovative innovation, the ship innovation design came, um, we were not at the beginning, we didn't think that we could qualify for it. But then um, after discussing with my boss, um, like a day before the deadline, we, think, we thought that yes, this could have, this is, has, it has potential, it, has, it is innovative, it has not been tested anywhere else, we believe, at least not in the region. So we thought, okay, let's submit a proposal to the ship team and see how it goes. And we discussed with the, our colleagues from the ministry, and uh, we submitted the proposal. Um, two days after the deadline, they requested for an extension. So they gave us two days, and then we submitted on mid at midnight. And the following day, we got an answer that it was good and we were funding to, funding to come here. Now, we thought since we were discussing, we were, we've been working on a lot of the ministry, it would be a good idea to bring our partner along. Um, it's, we always say it's, it's better that our partners say good things about us than we say about ourselves. So we wanted to hear more about to have the ministry um, present and discuss this idea and be more in the back burner and let them be up front. So that's basically a background on how we are here today. So um, we're going to present the Jamaican context, so she give you a bit of background. So it's not all about um, partying and beaches and tourism. There is a, a lot, much more insightful um, um, things about about Jamaica and the Ministry of Finance and Planning, planning complex. Now, what's good about that is that UNDP does not have a um, a long experience of working with ministries of finance. We, we usually work with planning, with other, you know, with environment, but not finance. So it was really a good thing for us to start from now. And then, um, then we're going to discuss the partnership we had with the NTP and the Ministry of Finance and Planning, and we're going to present after that the actual behavioral insights using design thinking for the change management of the Ministry of Finance. So we're not going to let my colleague um, discuss the content, some of the content with you. Thank you. I almost want to say Dr. Elsie, but we don't have that relationship, so I can say Elsie and we're comfortable. We want to thank you so much for having us here today. Um, it was something that we weren't actually, it wasn't even in our headspace, but I believe because the Ministry of Finance and Planning is seeking to utilize innovative approaches that the universe responded. And so we are here today. So it's been a wonderful opportunity and we are truly humbled and privileged to both at the same time. So you may have heard about Jamaica, and as we established, it's more than just a party. Um, where is it in the region? There you see it on the screen in red. Right, I heard the name, I heard the name. So we have a box let to you. There is no snow in Jamaica, but we have a bobsled team. Uh -huh. And let me just say that the bobsled team actually beat one of the US teams yeah. where they have snow. Yeah. On snow. Yeah. So we also have a lot of um, authentic culture. So Miss Lou is one of our persons that we consider who she's our blessed memory, but is somebody who really took our culture to the world. Um, and of course, we know the other person who took it to the world, yeah. Mr. Gold, the fastest man in the world. Of course, Jamaica is known for its sand, sea, and sun. So it is a tourist mecca, so please see me after for advice as to when to come, which is anytime, by the way, because it's always summer in Jamaica. 
And of course, <laughs> I'm not sure how many people know that icon. Yeah. That is Bob Marley, right? So he is our, I won't say reggae god, but he's the person who puts us on the map in terms of reggae music. So, we have that part of us, but we're also a country with a vision. What is it that we see for ourselves? And we have a national planning document that is having us um, in 2030 be Jamaica, the place to live, to work, raise families, and do business. So what does that really mean? It means Jamaicans are empowered to achieve their fullest potential. It means Jamaicans are secure, cohesive and just, economy is prosperous and it has a healthy natural environment and then you see what some of the national outcomes are to those goals. So what does that mean for the Ministry of Finance? So the Ministry of Finance sits in the government of Jamaica and for the Ministry we have identified two main national goals that the Jamaica society is secure, cohesive and just as well as of course the economy is prosperous for it's about fiscal responsibility and economic policy. You want to hear that? Let's turn it up. So besides, don't worry, which is really something that Jamaicans have spread, you know? You come to Jamaica to relax and to chill. However, everything is not necessarily going to be all right because we have some challenges, right? So when we're having fun and party, there are also some serious challenges ahead of us. So, right now we have issues of high public debts. Um, we have a declining exchange rate against the US dollar. Limited fiscal space. So, even when, it, when we're getting money to the grant funding, we're limited in what we can actually receive because of some of those constraints put on us. And that we have a veto uh, coming out of the end of agreement. Low growth. So, for years we've had challenges with actually growing the economy. Um, and that is something that we're seeking to address. Increasing energy costs. Um, so the cost of fuel has been increasing exponentially. And of course, that has an effect on our economy and how we're able to actually produce. Um, we have been subject to frozen public sector wages. Um, we're actually probably going into our fourth or fifth memorandum of understanding, which means since 2009, public servants have not received a pay. So what our financial secretary likes to say as well is that for some persons in the private sector, they also have had frozen salaries, not everybody. But that is the, the, the extent to which we have had, been having some of our challenges. And of course, it's not that we've not been trying to change our environment and trying to change things that are not going well, but we've been having limited success with those change efforts and those reform efforts. And hence, we're here today at Shift Events. So, one of the significant things that we've done, because we actually were with those and I have agreement for a while, and if you understand in terms of our debts, one hundred and forty percent, meaning the debt was much more than what we were able to earn in terms of GDP. So it means once you've taken out payments of loans, the little that you're left with to actually provide services to the rest of the country. Um, that was the situation we found ourselves in. And an agreement was made with the IMF. And that agreement is now in place. And coming out of that agreement as well, or connected to it, is something that we call our economic reform program. And what that means is that we now have particular things that we need to be looking at, including public sector transformation, including looking at improving our economic and fiscal policies, looking at doing much more our operations much more efficiently. So those are just some of the things that the economic reform program is looking at. One of the things that I want to bring to your attention is the Public Financial Management Reform Action Plan. What that means is that the government of Jamaica has sat down and with its multilateral said, this is the plan that we have for ourselves. What has been happening for most countries who are developing countries is that they, we go to the multilaterals and we ask them, what can you give us? And they have their priorities of what it is that they want to achieve, which sometimes is not connected to what we need at that time, and at that point in time. And what has happened is that we have been having activities that have not been in the right sequence, that has had consequences that we didn't even foresee, that have put us 
not almost in a almost in a worse position because they have not been properly aligned. So what that public financial management reform program was done was aimed to do an action plan. This is what we want to achieve. Well to that around come to us and let us have a conversation of how you can contribute to what we want to do. So that in itself is in an innovative way because you run the risk of multilateral saying you're not on our agenda. We withhold our money, which they have every right to do with their money. But that has not been our experience. So that is something that again is innovative and that we want to, to, to thank all of those persons in Mr. Finance who were part of that process. Because it took time while they're doing the normal day to operations to actually create that document. The other thing that was very innovative as well was our economic program oversight committee, which is called an EPOC. Now, this committee was comprised of civil society and private sector, as well as government. Um, and what its aim is to do is to oversee and monitor how we are performing against that iron of agreement that was made. Because remember, it's, it's not just the public sector's wages that have been frozen. It's not just the public sector that has been you know, under some constraints. It's the entire country. So how are all of us coming together going to agree and ensure that what we have um, agreed to is actually maintained? Because the end will come to every quarter to ensure that you pass your IMF tests. Okay. Who has the majority in that? Um, the government would have the major majority, but there are significant private sector interests that are represented um, in that committee. So when Ma Madame Lagarde, who is the managing director for the IMF, came to us in June, she actually raised the part of EPOC as being something innovative, um, and that is not something that has ever happened before, and that she's actually considering having that as part of future IMF roll-up programs. So to have that ownership and value, because generally people feel uh, I don't know, imposed. There's no, you know, it's just something you have to do because you, you need to pay your bills. But I think the approach that we've taken is really to get that ownership and buy-in so that we have that commitment to actually run the course. And of course, that, um, all of some of those things also came from our strategic review. And the strategic review was basically saying, if, we're, if we want to get to Vision 2030, the ministry has to do some things differently. Um, and that's like I was saying, it can't be the tweaking we've passed that stage, and it can't be just the transactional things. It has to be radical because we're so far, um, you, know, you know, it's in such a difficult situation that we find ourselves that just trying to fix and you know put a band-aid on it can't help. So the strategic review is looking, taking a very drastic look at how we operate, taking a look at how we how we feel about ourselves. So there's a little of you know, how our employees engage, do they feel a part of the ministry, what is their contribution. Um, so it looks at structure. Currently, the, the financial secretary who is in charge of the Ministry of Finance has 22 direct reports. 22 people reports to the financial secretary. And as he likes to say, for one week, each person, each one of those persons, he had a meeting before all, oh, half the week would be gone immediately. And that's not the minister who comes and has, that's not other meetings. And so it, it really is an unsustainable way of operating, particularly as our challenges increase, there needs to be much more time and energy spent towards policy making as opposed to spending time. I mean, can you imagine appraisal time for the financial secretary with 22 people to appraise? Right? So those are some of the challenges that we've identified in our strategic review. So based on, on all of those things happening in our environment, um, again, it has to be something significant and radical. It can't be a, a tweaking and a band-aid. So, hence transformation. So the Ministry of Finance has embarked on a transformation program. And what does that mean? It means we look at all of the elements. So typical change management looks at structure, and you have you know, traditional change management methodologies, but there has to be something that was different about this approach. And we're going to get into what the difference is. I also see this time around, right? What are we going to be doing differently? But the, the focus is on the center of excellence that we want to create. So the Ministry of Finance is a premier ministry in the, the government of Jamaica. How is it going to make a difference? How is it going to replicate what it has done to the rest of the government and even to other to, to, to countries outside of the region, outside of Jamaica, you know, countries in the region, etc. 
So that includes looking at high talent workforce in other organization. It's looking at technology enabled business processes. So of course we went through, um, and also goes through looking at the process, you know, all of the things from the very beginning for the adult, adult care and all the way to the end. So is the process itself structured the right way? Where are the bottlenecks? What are some of the challenges? How do we address the process before we add the technology? Because otherwise you just get a very expensive, non-functional process, right? So those are some of the things. And then there is a culture that we also need to instill of service. Um, and the, the customers are not just the persons who are to citizens, but it's actual members of, of the ministry as well. So how can we ensure that we serve each other, that we get what we need done in a way that's helpful and of course productive. And of course the structure that needs to pull all of those things in. Um, because right now we have um, a lot of silos, 22 direct reports, almost 22 to get a feeling and then people there's not much coordination. Um, they had their perceptions of people having empire, building empires and being very territorial and, and then this is a ministry where money is king, right? So that that, that brings in some other issues and challenges. So I said that change could not be normal. It couldn't be it couldn't be just the, the normal fear. It had to be something radical. Because we've tried things in the past, we've tried culture initiatives. Um, they haven't worked. And what has happened is that the staff of the ministry have become very change, lethargic, and weary. You know, they hear another term, okay, you know, and it becomes the next buzzword. What is the new thing? And how long will that last until the next thing comes? Um, so we can't even use certain words in the ministry anymore. You can't say culture change. People freak out, right? So we had to have a new approach, and Elsie is going to take us into what that new approach is. The new approach is UNDP. <laughs> <laughs> UNDP added value, and this is at, at that point that they came to us. Um, we had a my resident, the resident, and myself. We met the minister of finance and um, financial secretary. And they discussed the whole process to us. Of course, everybody knew what was going on in Jamaica at that time, but then they came to us and they wanted UNTP's help in ensuring that um, we get the best expertise to get them through this process. So, um, you and we all know that our mission is to effect changes, is to change people's life, whether it's people or uh, institutions, government, so that's the one of our key attributes, one of our key values. Um, UNDP worldwide is more than um, effecting changes. Well, we've done, we've done also some change management, um, for example, in our structures, some of them were quite successful, some not, but in terms of the development part of it, we have been successful to effect changes in people's lives. Um, the other value is in terms of capacity development. This is one of the key things that partners around the globe know UNDP for, and this is how, why the Commission came to us. They know that we've had a lot of projects building capacity of governments, of institutions, of civil society groups, of community-based organizations, of people, of grassroots organizations. So this is one of our key features within capacity. And the other but, um, added value is technical assistance, which we provide quite well. We don't have a lot of money, we're not a donor, but what we what we are capable of doing is we are capable of reaching out to um, experts, to our colleagues. Like we are in Jamaica, we, um, we, we are based in Jamaica, but here we are in Turkey, for example. We have over 170 country offices to which we can go to at any time to get to know what has been done in other places so that we replicate things so we don't start from scratch. So we have this kind of knowledge around the globe that we can build on, that we can tap on to provide technical assistance to governments. Mm -hmm. So that will include, for example, um, two years before this actual transformation process, um, when, when the government was going to the IMF agreement, they were trying to sign an agreement. They came to UNDP um, to help them in that, that exchange program. Already, and it was a successful one. Um, we also had a change in culture managing capacity in our in, the, in our organization, and they, they were quite aware of what's going on currently in UNTP headquarters, and they knew that we are we used to that, and this is why they thought that well, let's see how we can innovate in public service. How can we use 
we had to get expertise and see how we can apply a new approach, not the traditional change management management approach, but a new approach to this um, gardening initiative. So the partnership started then. The added value of the NDP was discussed with the ministry. We had several um, meetings um, at the ministry. We discussed possibilities, um, especially in terms of how we can apply new techniques to change management, behavioral insights or other things, for example. Um, we, we then discussed the best way to do it. Are we going to, we don't have money, but how can we help? At least do the procurement process, at least um, reach out to other colleagues and see what has been done in other places. So what we've done is we have um, research, we have written to our um, service centers, we have written to our headquarters to see what kind of approaches have existed um, in the world in terms of change management. Looking at all what she said, the challenges that she raised in terms of people being tired of hearing the word change and you know culture, all these things, what would be a very innovative approach to change management? And this is how we came up with the um, using design thinking um, through behavioral insights. Behavioral insights is something that could be new for a lot of you here. It was new for me when I heard about it. Um, I know it's quite um, maybe in Europe, especially in the United Kingdom. It's, I think it was studied from there. Um, but in our region, I do not think there, is any, there has to be any country that has applied this concept yet in terms of change management, especially um, using the design thinking approach. So what UNTP has proposed, that's our value proposition, we're going to work with UNTP Jumbe, we're going to participate together with them. It will be a, 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 a partnership effort of UNTP and the Ministry of Finance and Planning to work together on this particular component of the transformation program. And that would, that would um, doing, doing so would help UNTP because what happened is when she mentioned fiscal space constraint, we also have a constraint in terms of um, our delivery, because since most of the ministries do have ceiling in terms of the amount of money they are able to spend, so our little money too, when it goes to them, they said they can't spend it because it's beyond their ceiling. And because of that, we have suffered um, this year and, and, and late last year of low delivery because it cannot um, absorb the money that we're able to give them. So we're saying that by working with the government, and, let it, and, and helping them to overcome this, these challenges, then we should be able to also help ourselves to deliver very and assistance to, to the government. And, and of course, that would allow us to adventure into the in Jamaica. We have good relationship with the partners, we have very good programs, but if there is a problem in the Ministry of Finance that they cannot deliver, or they, there's a fiscal space everywhere in all ministries, then of course our mandate is at stake. So by helping them, we do adventure with the in Jamaica. And also, like I said before, we do not have the um, experience of working with Ministry of Finance before. I think UNDP usually works in with planning or whatever. So this, by, by, by uh, working with the premier ministry in the country, uh, um, would help us strengthen our relationship with the government in general. So, um, and in doing so, we'll, um, I heard in that innovation, she said, working out loud, which I love a lot. I love that expression of working out loud to ensure that people know what you're doing. And this is not what we're doing right now. You know, partnering with the Ministry of Finance and planning in Jamaica. And work out loud, when we go back, we will certainly share all this with other ministries, with other partners, other <laughs> ITPs, um, international development partners, and uh, you know, to work out loud what you're doing. Right. So I'm going to. I'm going to let Judy um, present a bit more on the change management, especially the behavioral insight aspect of it. Thank you, Elsie. Um, what we've been talking about really has been that there is this traditional view of human behavior. We assume that people are rational, that we make rational choices. <laughs> right. So if we're if, if that is a premise on which we create these tools and methodologies, then we're gonna have some challenges. 
right? And of course, if we continue to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result, what, what's that definition of the real word for that? In, insanity, right? Right. So what this traditional view of human behavior says is one's personality plus whole reasoned judgment. And this is called change management when we need to manage the changes we need as we speak. But let me just say, really, it's one's personality plus whole reasoned judgment equals human behavior. But this hasn't worked, and it hasn't explained how people behave the way they do. So even when Emma was speaking about this, the smells and how that can trigger behavior. So I'm no longer able to remember that I'm hungry because there has been something that has gone awry. But the smell you now has a bit of priming thing there, and now it triggers a different behavior. But there's nothing based in rational thinking. And, and that's really what behavioral insights is trying to look at. It's trying to look at not just the normal rational thinking processes, but it's looking at how can we change our contexts? How can we explore how people can behave differently by changing simple things? And, and the part I love about it, and, and Emma also spoke about it, that that's relevant to design thinking, is that we now test it to see. So if variable A is changed, X results. If variable B changes, why results? And when we test and we understand the reason and understand exactly what happens, then we say, yes, we've succeeded in changing very early. Now we can replicate and take it forward because we have evidence to say this works, as opposed to just hoping, well, let's just pray that it will work. So there is that kind of scientific approach to it. So I'm also trying to wait because we, there is a YouTube video that I'm hoping will come up shortly. Thank you. 
mental process. Don't make it more difficult for me to pay the taxes. So can I do it online from the comfort of my home? Do I have to go leave from where I am, join a long line, you know, be further stressed that I'm actually have, having to pay money? Um, make it attractive. And then of course, I'm also spoke about this. I'm not going to say but the things are actually, they are related. Make it social. So the first place people will go now is um, uh, Facebook. It is Twitter. It's in, those are the places people go to rather than this government building that you know is so impersonal. And of course, make sure you use at the right time. So when are you going to talk to me about pension? Not when I'm about to retire, but what is the timing? When are you going to speak to me about family planning at a particular time in life? When are you going to speak to me about insurance? Perhaps you know, when, when I'm having my first child and it, and it has now registered that I need to do something differently. So all of these things we're talking about are changing contexts, which is a, it's improving how we actually do change management. So I'm not going to go through this, but basically what B I and the B behavioral economics looks at is encouraging certain behaviors and discouraging other behaviors. Right? So volunteerism, we spoke about it in our small groups. How do we encourage volunteerism? How we how do we discourage absenteeism? And that's one of the things that behavioral economics will be seeking to do in the Ministry of Finance. How do we get people to be engaged? How do we increase motivation? How do we improve productivity? So public policy implementation involves influencing or changing behavior. And of course, we already have established that people are complex and are oftentimes irrational. How do we now use this BI as an invaluable tool? Those key psychological understandings, not that we understand human behavior in a different way. How can we use low cost, low pain methods to actually influence the behavior that we want to see? And the results, reduction of inefficiencies and increased revenues. And now hand over to Chelsea. Okay, um, now we researched further in terms of design thinking and then we thought that let's see how others have applied design thinking in this context of behavioral insight. What she just described, which is really looking at how we can, I'm not going to say manipulate, but how we can um, influence people's mind by making some, some, some certain things easy for them, like the envelope that the, the gentleman mentioned, how you can make, make it easy for them to influence, to develop that just a little tweak can change things. So we said, um, but looking at this in the design thinking mind, um, and we, are, we had, it, we had it, um, approached the, the model that was designed by, by um, Stanford Institute, the model into design thinking, which includes these different this steps, which um, actually Emma had to, is working us through. The first one being, for example, the empathize. Empathize is in terms of needs, looking at the user needs, what are our users, what are the needs we seek to achieve. So before developing the solution, we, we have to know exactly what we seek to do. Or who are we targeting, for example? Right? And then based on that, then we, we define the needs. After you discuss with the users, with different stakeholders, you define the specific need. You come up with one thing that needs to be changed, that you need to affect. Mm -hmm. And then idea. This is, this is a time where, for example, you would be looking at possible, possible solutions um, for, for a specific, to address a specific need. And then the prototype, I believe that we'll be saying tomorrow with Emma, when based on the um, different solutions that you, you have brainstormed on, you finally you put it at one solution to technology or whatnot, not, and then test it to see that it worked. You test it to, in your population, and then you refine based on the testing, and when it works, you replicate it to order. So using that process and the, and the behavioral insights, we should be able to say, okay, does it work for the Ministry of Finance? Is the solution okay? Is it able to replicate? Has it changed here at the test level? Have we noticed any significant changes in, in people's reaction or in the people's, um, in the employees in the ministry? And if so, can that now be replicated to other ministries? Because eventually, this is going to be something that will, that will go to um, the government, all the ministries, 
it, it's going to start here um, as a pilot for the ministry, but eventually it will be in a government. So, so when you now, um, when I'm, I'm trying to map each of each step of the process with the actual behavior inside, you will see how they are linked to each other. Like the, the enterprise, for example, which would be when they're going to conduct culture assessment. That's the first step of the behavior inside process. They would come to the ministry and they're going to conduct a culture assessment. They're going to discuss with staff, understand where they're coming from, what has worked, what has not worked in the past, what needs to be changed, and assess the where they are at in terms of culture. And that's the empathy, uh, that the, that's the empathy part of it. That's the knowledge analysis part of it. The second one, the, de the definition. This is where they're going to target critical needs. Those that have, they have defined there, they're going to, to target the, the technical operation that, that that may be the first subject of, um, of tweaking because there are things that, are, that can be changed right there. You know, put an envelope somewhere, we change someone's um, behavior immediately. So, looking at, for example, critical areas where this can be applied immediately. Um, when, and then, idea to look at the, the solutions now, based on the needs, based on the specificities of, of what has been. Um, determine after the culture assessment, then we should be able to explore possible solutions. And I believe, uh, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but what we've just done now, in terms of all the little um, post-its that we have, could have been that that step where we are idea. Any any solution is good, whether it's rubbish, like say whatever. You know, brainstorm one solution, and then eventually, after this step. This is where you say, okay, which are the best ones? Which are going to be the top solutions that could be transformed and prototyped into that will generate really the, the, the transformation or um, that we want the change management? Which one should be included or embedded in the change management strategy that they are going to develop? And once prototyped and tried out in the Ministry of Finance and Planning, did that change management strategy, communication strategy, try it out? and see how it will work out. And eventually, we find it, we visit, and possibly replicate it to other agencies. So basically, this is what we are doing right now. Um, we are in this, at this step now. We have, we are um, in the process of recruiting a company um, from UK, actually. Um, and I, I believe it's, we, we cannot say now the name because the process has not, has not ended yet, but both companies are for UK anyway, so <laughs> both, are both the companies that are still being contracted. So we are doing that, it's going to be a two year process um, where they, they would be applying behavior insight through design thinking to perform change management in the Ministry of Finance and Planning. So this, we are at this level right now. And we're trying to see how we can move forward. Um, UNDP being the the link between the consultant and the government. Of course, the government is going to work directly supervising the consultant, but we will be we will help facilitate the process. And then um, this this um, BI was saying that it would be a model for Jamaica for the public sector renewal. We're hoping it will be a model for them after two years ago, it is. Um, and not only for Jamaica, but also for other countries, for other SIDS, um, SIDS being small island development states, countries in the region. Maybe because a lot of these countries in the region have the same challenges as Jamaica. Barbados has also a high level of, of debt. Um, 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 GDP per capita region. They, they have a lot of problems, the same kind of problems in the public sector that Jamaica is having, but have they thought about any of this? So if this is a success, perhaps the NDPDR can also build on that. And it will be probably one of the first, um, one idea that could be applicable to other, to other countries. And we, we really think it's innovative as well. And, um, and you know the challenges with the middle income countries, they do not have the access to ODA, which is eight, development aid, as much as lower um, LDCs, least developed countries, there is the other issue. Yet, they, they need the money, but they don't have access as much money as LDCs. 
So perhaps that would also help looking at what our interventions <coughs> can be located to these countries to make sure that we also manage that change um, properly. And um, now, if you can read this, shift happens. Shift happens. And you are key to change, right? Um, and I'm going to let, leave you with the last slide, which is a reflection of um, what we think that we are going to, to do in the next future, which, which is a reflection also of what we are thinking behind this innovative idea. Old ways won't open new doors. That was that's an unknown offer. And then I would like you, I would like to leave you um, by questioning yourself. When was the last time you did something for the first time? When was the last time you did something for the first time? Thank you. Perfect.